Kia ora team, welcome back to the 2.6 video series. This lesson is going to be about adaptations to abiotic factors. In this lesson you'll be learning about photosynthesis, transpiration and adaptations in emergent, subcanopy and shrub layers in the forest. By the end of this lesson you should be able to describe the adaptations plants have to get enough light for photosynthesis, Describe the adaptations plants have to minimise water loss and describe the adaptations plants have to withstand the wind. So this is a slide from a previous lesson. Remember that having many strata creates many niches to be occupied. Plants occupying different niches need to have different adaptations. For example, trees in the emergent layer need to have different adaptations to plants in the shrub layer to be able to survive in that niche. Because remember, Gauss's competitive exclusion principle states that no two species can occupy the same exact niche and stably coexist. So plants have to have different adaptations to occupy different niches. Before we can discuss the different adaptations plants have, we need to talk about photosynthesis. Photosynthesis is the process in which plants use light, water, and carbon dioxide to produce glucose and oxygen. This glucose produced will go on to produce the energy plants need to grow and produce flowers and seeds for reproduction. For this achievement standard, we just want to focus on the first half of this reaction equation here boxed in green. Water, carbon dioxide, sunlight, and chlorophyll. So let's start with sunlight. How does the plant get enough sunlight? Plants have chlorophyll. Chlorophyll is a green molecule that absorbs light energy from the sun. Chlorophyll molecules are found in chloroplasts. Chloroplasts are organelles, small organs found inside the plant cell, and they're the location for photosynthesis. That's where photosynthesis happens. Why? because that's where chlorophyll is located inside. So in this picture, you can see individual plant cells. Here's one here, circled in black. And inside the plant cells are many chloroplasts, these circle green blobs. And they're green because they contain many chlorophyll molecules. Let's move on to water and carbon dioxide. How does the plant obtain water? Water is absorbed by the roots of the plant through a process called osmosis. Osmosis is the movement of water molecules from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration. And how does a plant obtain carbon dioxide? Carbon dioxide from the air enters through tiny holes on the underside of a leaf called stomata through a process called diffusion. Diffusion is just a term for the movement of molecules from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration. So very similar to osmosis, but osmosis is specifically about water. So I mentioned stomata before. Stomata are a structural adaptation. They're a physical feature. They can actually open and close, like in this GIF here, depending on the physical conditions outside, the abiotic factors outside the that the plant experiences. When stomata open, so when they open like this, Carbon dioxide enters the plant and water vapor exits. Water vapor are just little tiny droplets of water. When stomata closes, like this, there's no movement of carbon dioxide and no movement of water vapor. There's actually a name for when water vapor leaves the plant and it's called transpiration. Transpiration is the process by which water vapor evaporates from plant leaves. It helps a plant draw water up from its roots, but too much transpiration is not a good thing. So all plants need to have adaptations to reduce the rate of transpiration to slow down the water loss from leaves. All plants have a waxy cuticle that helps seal in water. The waxy cuticle also protects the plant from heat. So some plants have a thicker waxy cuticle than others, kind of like layers of clothing. That's why I've got this icon here. The second thing all plants have are stomata, the holes and only passageway for carbon dioxide and water vapor to leave the plant leaf. Stomata just describes the hole. 
It has this structure called guard cells, which are the actual cells that do the opening and closing of stomata to control the rate of transpiration. Going back to the image here, these two are the guard cells that control whether the stomata is open or closed. And the stomata is just this hole here. Guard cells close the stomata when the sun's out to prevent transpiration from taking too much water away from the plant leaves. And guard cells open the stomata at night to allow carbon dioxide to enter the leaf. Finally, some plants may even reduce the number of stomata, especially if they're in hot environments like desert cacti. I understand if some of you are still confused as to what a waxy cuticle is. So I've, I've included these two pictures to help me illustrate this structure and function. As I said earlier, all plants have a waxy cuticle, but some have ones thicker than others. For example, succulent plants that are adapted to withstand drought conditions have very thick, very obvious waxy cuticles. You can clearly see this waxy cuticle when you snap a succulent leaf and pull one part of the leaf against the other, peeling away this waxy cuticle here. As you can see, it covers the leaf like glad wrap, and it holds all of that glistening moisture, you can see all this glistening moisture, in the plant, so the plant doesn't dry out or desiccate in drought or dry condition. This other picture here shows the waxy cuticle as a thick, transparent layer. It needs to be transparent so that it doesn't block out the sunlight from reaching the chloroplasts in this darker green area. It doesn't prevent the chlorophyll from capturing the sunlight's energy. In this picture here, you can see a single layer of plant cells that are directly inside a waxy cuticle layer. You can see there's tiles of normal plant cells here, and space between those are guard cells that open and close the stomata. So guard cells are pointed by the red arrows, and stomata is pointed by the blue arrows. Guard cells are doing the opening and closing, whereas the stomata is the actual hole where CO2, carbon dioxide, and water vapor enters and exits. Cool, so when you're writing about these adaptations in your report, you should focus on three strata. Emergent, subcanopy, and shrub. And think about what adaptations they've got to help them withstand the abiotic stra uh, factors in their strata. Cool, so let's start with the emergent layer. What are the adaptations in them? Well, to withstand very high light intensity, the plants have small leaves because they don't require as much surface area for photosynthesis, so small leaves. They also have light green leaves because they don't need as much chlorophyll to get enough photosynthesis going. To withstand very high temperature or very low humidity, they have a thick, thick, thick waxy cuticle to protect them from heat and limit that water loss. They also have small leaves and less surface area so that there's less transpiration happening. Because remember, transpiration happens on the underside of the leaf. So the larger the leaf you've got, the more transpiration you've got happening. They've also got less stomata to reduce transpiration. And the stomata remain closed to reduce transpiration. What adaptations have they got to withstand very high wind speeds? They've got a thick trunk for stability, and they've got buttress roots for stability. They've also got small leaves that won't act like a parachute in strong winds. So here they've got small light green leaves, and they've got a thick trunk with buttress root for stability. And two really good examples of uh, trees in the emergent layer is the Rimu and the Kaikatea tree. All right, let's look at the adaptations in the subcanopy layer. And in this layer, we're gonna focus on tree ferns. Tree ferns have a very large pinnate compound leaves to maximize surface area for photosynthesis. So what do I mean by pinnate compound leaves? Well, pinnate means they've got leaflets, so smaller leaves that are arranged on both sides of this midline stem here. Cool, so they've got tiny leaves on both sides of the stem. This maximizes the surface area of the leaf. Tree ferns also have fronds which unfurl from koru, allowing the brown tree fern to grow upwards and above the plants below so that they can get more light. So here is that koru of the brown tree fern and the koru is always at the top of the plant because it wants to grow upwards. 
This kōru unfurls to reveal pinnate fronds, which are these guys here, the small leaflets on either side of the stem. To withstand the temperature and the medium humidity, they've got a well-developed vascular system that delivers water and nutrients to support their very large fronds and leaves. To withstand medium wind speeds, the cell walls and the tree trunk are strengthened by deposits of a compound called lignin. So lignin is a compound that just strengthens the tree trunk. The lower tree trunk is reinforced with thick interlocking mats of tiny roots. So here you can see the silver fern tree trunk is reinforced by interlocking mats of roots. Trees next to each other can also join together when their roots intertwine and join. And this is for giving the plant additional support. So here you've got two separate brown tree ferns. And remember that the tree fern trunk is composed of interlocking roots. And the roots can actually grow into each other from different trees. And they can connect to support two trees that can lean onto each other. And finally, if the trunk starts to lean onto one side, roots grow faster on that side that's leaning on to form buttress roots. And finally, the third layer, the shrub layer. What are the adaptations in the shrub layer? Well, to withstand low light intensity, plants in the shrub layer have broad leaves to maximize the surface area so that they can capture as much, li as much light as possible. They also have dark green leaves, which contain more chloroplasts and more chlorophyll to capture as much light as possible. And to withstand low temperatures and high humidity, they have thin waxy cuticles because there's no need to reduce transpiration. It's pretty humid in the shrub layer. And they have a normal number of stomata because there's no, real, there's no need to reduce transpiration. Some examples of the shrub plants are the kanono, koprosma and hangihangi. Great, so I'd like to check your understanding. Question one, what is required for photosynthesis? Choose all correct answers. A, water, B, carbon dioxide, C, sunlight, and D, chlorophyll. Question two, the majority of a plant stomata will look like this when A, it's nighttime, B, conditions are very hot, C, conditions are very dry, D, all of the above. This stomata is closed. Question three. I have small light green leaves with a thick waxy cuticle. Which strata will you likely find me in? A, shrub, B, subcanopy, C, canopy, and D, emergent. Question four. What adaptations are commonly found in plants that live in the shrub layer? A. Buttress roots. B. Wide leaves. C. Very thick waxy cuticle. And D. More chlorophyll and chloroplasts. Question 5. Chloroplasts are green molecules that absorb light energy from the sun. Chloroplast molecules are also found inside chlorophyll. True or false? A. True. B. False. Kappa, you've made it to the end of the lesson. So by now you should be able to describe the adaptations plants have to get enough light for photosynthesis, describe the adaptations plants have to minimize water loss, and describe the adaptations plants have to withstand the wind. Thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next video.